is Heidi Trimble, and I'm a Palooza Committee member, and I'm pleased to welcome our sponsors from Cisco, Shri Bassetti, Director of Supply Chain Transformation, and Mary DeBonis, Business Operations Manager, Supply Chain Transformation. Shri and Mary are here to talk to us today about the future of global supply chain. How's everyone doing today? Good. Good morning. Um, well, so just a quick background around myself. I'm Sri Bachati. Um, as I was introduced, I'm a director in the supply chain transformation team within the supply chain organization at Cisco. Uh, I lead the transformation team at Cisco. So uh, my team kind of manages large cross-functional programs, which are uh, across supply chain and with other functions within um, Cisco. Um, prior to, I've been with Cisco for seven years. Um, prior to Cisco, I was at Deloitte doing a lot of technology consulting. Uh, I've worked with different industries, different clients, solving their technology challenges. Um, so my entire career has been in technology space and technology transformation. And I'm Mary Devonis, and I work with Sri on the business transformation team uh, in the supply chain operations group. I've done so many different roles in my decades you know, <laughs> long career. Lots of different operations for different marketing, to sales operations, and now supply chain. Um, I won't go through all the details of uh, my client, but just wanted to say, you know, we're excited to be here to share our story with you and um, to you know, learn about the supply chain and grateful to share this time with you. So, with that, I'll let you choose. Awesome. Thanks, Clay. Um, the supply chain, it's not a foreign word anymore. I think three years ago, nobody was talking about supply chain. It was hard for us to get like that limelight of to explain to people like, what do you do? Like, again, like, what does supply chain mean? You mean logistics? You mean transportation? Like it was like a um, different perspective, right? And I think supply chain means different to different folks, right? Some, as soon as you talk about supply chain, people think about logistics or people think about people actually manufacturing in the factory or about new product introduction, right? But when we think about supply chain at Cisco, it's everything, right? It's how do you introduce a new product in the market to where do you manufacture it? Where, where should the factory be located? What is your customer experience? What, how are you going to get it to the customer? Like, are you going to ship it by air or by ship? Or what does it look like? And what's the quality of the product, right? Um, so everything that we work with is hardware products, right? The hardware supply chain. So as you can imagine, about, as I said, two or three years ago, it was like people didn't talk about supply chain. And since then, since pandemic hit, we've all seen the supply chain crisis. And especially at Cisco, you can imagine there was this also the global um, uh, the chip shortages, right? Uh, the semiconductor crisis we were in. So what that did to us about two years ago was we had pandemic as well as the global crisis on the semiconductor industry. Our um, demand and supply was the highest volatility. What that meant is our demand went super high and the supply was really low. We were we we had like record high bookings and backlog where we couldn't like serve to the customers. Our lead times were like highest ever. There was like about, like for some products, our lead time is like maybe a week or two weeks. And that went all the way up to like few months. And obviously that meant very frustrated customers. Uh, so we had to think out of the box, right? So we had to think about how do we get ahead of it? Like how do we be more creative about how do we build the products? Where are, are, are there alternate sources for like sourcing our components, building it, be more creative? We did figure out that a lot of our processes broke. And so that's where the transformation play came in place, where we had to think about out of the box and figure out how do we bring, build a more resilient and agile supply chain. And I think as we all have learned through pandemic, I think this volatility is here to stay. I don't think we'll see a steady kind of, I'm sure there's something else that's going to come up in like next few years where we'll have to learn from this crisis and kind of respond. So what we're going to talk today is just what we learned through the challenges, how we approached it, and how we're going to move forward. But to give an appreciation, um, so before we go there, I wanted to start with just a view of what is Cisco, right? How big we are, how complex our supply chain is, because that will give you an appreciation of the challenges we face and how we kind of went about it. So just from a big picture perspective, right? Um, so right now we are in our fiscal year 23. 
So our last year revenue was about 51 billion. Uh, we have about 86,000 employees across 99 countries with about 363 offices globally. And then when we click down from a supply chain standpoint, just from a supply chain perspective, right? That we have about 2,800 employees. Those are like our Cisco employees. But when we look at our overall network with our partners, suppliers, manufacturers, our, our network is about 25,000 people. So that's the number of people that work in Cisco supply chain. Um, we are located in 15 countries, uh, 13 countries across 15 locations. And to just give the complexity, we have 143,000 unique components, which are sourced across 600 suppliers. So you can imagine when crisis hit, we were trying to manage all of those various components across that huge supplier base. Um, we have about 1.5 million orders that were shipped in FY22. And when you do the math, it's about 4,800 orders every day that were being shipped out. And then we have about 38,000 orderable parts and we introduced about 89 pa new parts or new uh, products in FY22. And I'm proud to say like Cisco, last but not the least, Cisco was ranked number one by supply chain as a global supply chain like organization over the last three years consecutively. So, so it is a very complex environment and it's um, a lot of creativity that keeps it going. And that's um, the kind of reflected from the Gartner rating there. And before we get into the learnings, right? We wanted to give you a feel for how are we structured uh, internally, right? Because I think as you can imagine with such a huge network, and the cross-functional work that needs to go on, organization is very important. How we are structured, who's doing what, and how do you cross-collaborate to make things happen? Um, so when you see, we've broken down into like seven functions within supply chain. Uh, the first like in function is where I was talking about new product introduction. That's our team that works with our business units to say, hey, what's in your pipeline? What's your product strategy? How are we gonna introduce into the supply chain network? Uh, the global planning team works with our sales team to figure out what's our revenue forecast, what does the forecast look like. Um, the supplier management, as you can imagine, is the team that works with all our suppliers from negotiations, where are we going to source our parts, so on and so forth. The manufacturing team kind of is the hands on the ground that's actually building the product. Um, the technology and quality team makes sure there is quality assurance processes in the to make sure the product that's manufactured meets our quality standards. And then the logistics operation is the one that figures out how do we kind of make our um, logistic optimal, like optimally scale it, but at the same time it meets the customer needs. And the service operations is the team that takes care of the returns, the RMAs and so on and so forth when there is a challenge with a product and that needs to come down. And so Mary and I are part of the team at the bottom which says supply chain transformation. So we have a central team that works with all of the functions within supply chain to drive any large major transformation product, projects. And it can be like technology transformation, it can be process efficiency. If you know folks in supply chain, we all talk about efficiencies, how can we make it more efficient? So there is always um, things that we do from a transformation standpoint. As you can imagine, security has been like number one, like it's on top of everyone's mind. So we're doing some cool stuff from a security perspective. And obviously I'll touch upon more, but just from a sustainability perspective, from an environment and social responsibility perspective as well. So there's a lot of work that we do from a transformation standpoint. So with that said, I'm gonna hand it to Mary, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the challenges we faced, how we kind of address them, and then we'll wrap it up with what's our path forward in FY24. Right. Sweet. So, who's signed out? Oh, no, I think it's still okay. <laughs> yeah, it's going. It just doesn't look good. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Technical. <laughs> okay. Not, not, not me. Um. So before we get into uh, the, the challenges, yeah, I work at a tech company, right? Um. I wanted to to recap again. Like, let's um. You know, going back to the challenge that Sri just talked about. You know, we said we were experiencing high volatility. So what did that mean for us? That was bookings up to here. I mean, it was thirty percent year over year growth for three consecutive quarters. So 
highest level of backlog that Cisco has experienced in its 38 year company history. So huge. And then you saw global semiconductor crisis. So you've got backlog here, supply here, I mean, demand. So that just resulted in a, a massive amount of backlog. So what did our team do to respond to this? Um, our response to the challenges would be, you know, the next. Where is it? One. <laughs> I can just talk. <laughs> it freaks. Yeah, I think it's it. I think it's because it's talk. It's totally interrupting my flow. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for it. The suspense. <laughs> so while they do that, huh? So, you know, student, you know, what, what you guys are building this uh, local, uh, living local uh, facility, we were actually waiting for a lot of it. So, let me show you an area. Apology, apology. <laughs> we're coming out on the other side of this, though. So, you know, what we what we did is we launched an initiative, of course, you know, a program that what we said served as a, a rallying cry for our organization. And this was to really energize and mobilize the teams to make sure we were working in a collaborative, focused effort across the supply chain. So you saw the scale and complexity of our supply chain. It was really, we needed to take a, a center-led approach is what we called it from the transportation team to make sure that all of these sometimes siloed functions, right? We're working together to contribute to this like recovery. We designed the program to foster innovation and creativity. So it was really about how do we think differently? You know, what can we question about our process, our data and our system and where are those gaps? And let's figure out a way to, to solve them. You know, and finally, we needed to make sure that it was not only we had to con directly contribute, you could not do anything except contribute directly to this recovery. That was what the supply chain was focused on for the last year. And as Sri mentioned, it was really important to capture the learnings from all of this because this is really going to shape our, our strategy moving forward and what's it going to look like for the first time. Did I do it? Okay, great. So the rallying cry, we were very specific on the objectives that we needed to achieve in this. And the three of them are, again, the, the creativity and innovation. Like how do we make a difference short term? This wasn't about doing projects for the fun of it on, you know, maybe we'll see an ROI at some point. It was really like, how are you directly contributing to this? The second objective is how do we recover lead times and the credibility to our customers to let's meet our commitment? You know, we had a plan to build, ship this product. How do we meet that and still meet Cisco's like financial targets? And then finally, you know, we needed to establish playbooks. What we saw was an environment that we've never operated in, really super high volatility. We needed to make sure that we put the processes, systems, people in place so that we can manage something like this moving forward in a more efficient way. Uh, yeah. I'm getting good, you guys. So <laughs> <laughs> our approach. So this is, we took an agile approach um, and leveraged the scaled agile framework to, to tackle this. And the reason why that methodology really lends itself to this type of program is because we needed to prioritize. As I mentioned, there's 2,800 or three mentioned 2,800 people in our you know direct network. How do we make sure we're again focused on only capabilities that enables recovery? So we plucked transformation leads across the organization to evaluate what they were working on, to say, what are we gonna start, stop, continue, and get a list of these capabilities. The second priority on this is, how do we take these capabilities and 
put them into bodies of work that we called epics. So another agile terminology is, is the epics, so that we could create teams to effectively deliver results as quickly as possible. And then the last was, I mean, it's it's a theme throughout, like the learnings, the learnings to really help shape our next, what we're calling our next generation and like operating model. We've built a supply chain that I think is is resilient, as you've seen in the Gartner, you know, with ratings every week, but how do we be more adapted, adapted to change, you know? And this is some of the learnings and the gaps that we saw um, throughout this time. Okay, so I wanted to double click to give you guys a little bit of a flavor through a use case of what one of these epics might look like. Uh, so I mentioned that there was 10. Hi. There's a, this is just a piece, a piece of one. And if I go back to and talk about again, like flashback one year. We all remember, I think, from a consumer perspective, I don't know, where is, was anyone trying to buy a car at the time? Um, driving by lots, you see, you see empty lots, right? There's there's no cars for sale. There's a shortage. If you're trying to buy an appliance like I was, like a dishwasher, you, you weren't getting it, you know? So that was, that was what, you know, we were experiencing like daily. And our teams would get a plan and say, hey, you guys ship these out to the customers. Then you go to another planner and they'd do an analysis and be like, okay, we're short, however many hundred components. And then you'd say, well, when are these components coming? Are they even on order? We've got lead times extending for semiconductors over 52 weeks. It was very uncertain. We didn't know when it was coming. We really needed to get creative around this. So part of that creativity came through, you know, substitute parts. For example, the ideal scenario would be, can I take another part and just drop it onto this board and have it work? Now, these are highly technical engineering <laughs> products. You can't, that's the ideal scenario. The other end of the spectrum is, if it's so hard and we can't get the part, what type of, what flexibility do we have? Would we go as far as redesigning this board to accommodate a different type of part? And that's the extent to which we were actually faced with is to allow ourselves to get more flexibility, we would do that. So, but something like that would take so many people, meetings, phone calls, you guys know what it's like, right? Across engineering, product planning, um, manufacturing, just transformation, all of those functions would have to be involved in something like that. So you get the idea. This is this is for say one gating critical component. If we were to talk about 10, 50, 500, how about like a couple thousand components, right? Critical components that are gating the build of like your full product. That was our reality. So as, as simple as it sounds in the last couple of minutes that I described, it was really challenging. What we needed to do was ensure that we had a plan, um, a plan for all of our, our parts. And so enter the epic, wait for it. It was called the plan for every part. <laughs> a, a very creative name for an epic, but I would say all of our creative creativity and solutioning went into the ideas, you know, around the epic. But this is really depicting the problem that I just mentioned is we did not have a connected solution, a unified solution that really said from analysis to how much that shortage is to what do we need in a way that allowed us to get ahead of it. So how long in the horizon were we looking, you know, not far enough. How do we become more proactive instead of reactive? So in a situation like this, we can make more effective like decisions quicker and have the data available to us. And how is it so that we can not do it in this spreadsheet and this other spreadsheet and then this other tool, right? So just having one tool was, um, was something that we needed to do. That's, I think you get the problem. <laughs> so the approach or the solution that we took now, this this epic actually has a ton of like features and different processes and different systems and 
I'm just highlighting a couple of them here, but the, the fundamental change or the paradigm shift that we looked at for Plan for Every Park was really, how do we change this group, this group of planners to think differently? How do we get them from in a proactive mode instead of a reactive? So what I was talking about before is like, what are we short? What do we, how do we do it? Where do we get you know this from another supplier? Is let's let's get in front of this a little bit. How do we break this reactive cycle? And so two critical features that um, as part of this epic is around not only do you define metrics and performance indicators for this solution, no problem. Is, is really defining the um, tolerances for this, tolerances for, um, you know, for these metrics and having an alert system that tells us, instead of me having to do the analysis and figuring it out, is you tell me before it happens and when these metrics fall out of tolerance and alert me, and I'll go and work with the supplier and try to do this ahead of time. The other key feature around this was the segmentation of components. Now, Sri mentioned what, 140,000 components. So how do you how do you tackle something like this? I'm not gonna hire thousands of people, right, to, to look at a situation like this, but it's really bucketizing, is that a word? Bucketing these components into groups so that we can focus our time on those that have the highest impact. Where are the critical shortages? Who are the customers that we need to meet, you know, the, um, the backlog for and ship orders to? So segmentation is a really important piece of this. Again, bringing us back into a, a proactive, you know, type of thinking. And so the outcomes, our expected outcome of this is really we'd like to have better supply continuity. I mean, that's that's the supply chain dream, right? Is, so, is doing that and, and breaking that cycle before they become our reality. Um, it's also making sure that we know what's, what's next. If we extend our planning horizon, we can start to see along with that alert system, what's happening out there. We can work those issues and try to get ahead of it before we're actually needing to build the product. So all of this, we hope, you know, and, and that we're getting there is to contribute to fewer shortages. And at the end of the day, for supply chain, that would mean lower costs. You know, we're not dealing with urgent issues, expedites, et cetera. And, and really, the goal is to meet our customer expectations. Okay, so that was that was an exciting epic plan for every part. Um, <laughs> before I wrap it up, just to just to summarize, like we had again like ten capabilities, lots of things going on within each of those, and this is just to mention some of the the key actions that we took around some of these other capabilities um, and and accomplished over the last year. So the first one is around really scaling. Um, I talked about the planning portion of the components. It's also scaling our tools to be able to allocate that product. Now, it, you're not gonna eliminate supply shortages you know, completely, but what do you do in a time of shortage? How do we allocate most efficiently across this global supply chain network? The other area is um, around scaling and manufacturing. Now, scaling can mean something as, as easy as increasing your capacity, buying more equipment. But what we did also is scaling our manufacturing test processes by investing in test optimization strategies. So using machine learning, for example, to increase our throughput of, of tests to speed up that process from a manufacturing perspective. And then finally, you know, innovation, we talked a little bit about this is, is finding alternate suppliers and redesigning products and parts, you know, to accommodate different components was a lot of, a lot of creativity around that from our, our engineering team. Um, and the results. So if you remember back long time ago when I spoke about the objectives, um, you know, one of our objectives is we wanted to increase our, our factory build and search capacity so that we could decline, see a decline in our product lead times. And that's what we did. And we made a huge dent in our inventory and backlog. So, um, you know, a, a huge accomplishment uh, by the team. 
And I would say that there's still, while it sounds like maybe easy and that we've done all these great things, the learnings I think that we, you know, received from this is is huge. I mean, there's not only what we've done, but what we the road ahead and what we still have yet to do to really become, you know, that adaptive supply chain. And with that, I'm gonna let Sri talk about what it's gonna be looking like for us moving forward. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. So as Mary kind of walked through, right? I mean, so she just walked through one use case, but we looked at that just not, not from a plan for every part. And she mentioned 10 FX. We looked at every process, right? From like our planning perspective, from our test quality perspective, from like everything, like forecasting, how can we look ahead and so on and so forth, right? So as May kind of highlighted, there were a ton of learnings. So we are in this process. Our fiscal year is usually like, our fiscal year ends in July, June, and we start our new fiscal year in July. So there's been a ton of learnings over the last three years. And from a supply chain perspective, we said, hey, Going in, I think we are over the hump from a supply chain perspective, but as I said, I think volatility is here to stay. Um, so it's it, just from a timing perspective, it's perfect about what we're thinking about what's our strategy for supply chain going into the next fiscal year, right, in a few months. So I wanted to give you guys a sneak peek on what our supply chain strategies are going into FY24, because there's a ton that we've learned and we want to incorporate into our strategies. Um, so there was learning from the path, like the, the program that um, recovery program that um, Mary kind of talked through. But in addition to that, we said, what are the forces that are shaping and things that are happening around us, right? And so if you think about it, they're like this 10 major forces, like forces from like shareholders, shareholders perspective, the customer needs, uh, the product roadmaps, the geopolitical situation, which is constantly changing the global threats, we've all heard about security breaches, so on and so forth. So we want to make sure our supply chain is secured, the competition, technology, employees, so on and so forth. So we've taken all of this into consideration. And then these are our like six new six strategies. And I'll go bottoms up. We've always had innovation and future ready workforce in our strategy, right? And so we'll continue investing there because we, we believe that we need to be innovative and we need to keep thinking. And ideate uh, to build that resilient and agile and adaptive supply chain. Workforce is huge for us. Cisco has a great culture from an employee perspective, from the ecosystem we have. And so we need to continue to build and growing our peoples from a skill sets perspective, hybrid work, so on and so forth. The middle two is where we've kind of pivoted or evolved those strategies as any like company, we obviously want to think about our growth and profitability. So that's always been a area of strategizing, like how do we increase our top line and reduce our like, uh, the use operating costs and increase our margins. So that's what we'll be focusing in our profitable growth. But a lot of the learnings from that effort in the last three years is what, where we kind of talk that into adaptive supply chain. How do we evolve our supply chain and make it more resilient? How, how do we increase, like change our operating model to be more um, robust, right? And the, the two knew that we've elevated the focus. This has always been our focus, which is about customer experience, right? And so as, as kind of Mary mentioned, our lead times have been the highest and I think they're getting on the other side and the lead times have started decreasing now, but customer is the key, right? So we just wanna make sure our commitment stays with the customers and uh, where we kind of continue having that credibility with our customers across the board, right? So there's a huge focus on customer experience, not just from lead times, but even like returns process, like how easy is that? Like if we had to return a product and where do we need to go evolve that, right? Um, so that's customer experience. And as you can see, um, Cisco has like some um, public goals from a net zero perspective. So we definitely, and Obviously, supply chain has to play a huge role from a carbon footprint perspective, the social responsibility around like human rights, so on and so forth. So we've elevated our focus on the environmental, social, and governance responsibility. Uh, but that's what is in the future for us from a FY24 perspective. Um, with that, I think we'll wrap up, but I'm hoping to take some, or we are open to take some questions. Uh, Yeah, I'd like to learn more about machine learning. If you could expand on how you're using that in the supply chain and uh, the impact you mentioned. We use it in a lot of different areas, but specific to what we talked about from a test optimization perspective, it's really 
like looking at the historical data to understand like the patterns in you know what's happening with the testing and the results and you know for example a simple thing is if it's really if it's really successful this this lot right is going through well we're not going to like have to run it through with any like testing processes so there's a lot of work going on um, right now for us in the test optimization scale like we actually also use it, you know, in our um, demand planning space too. So there's a lot of, uh, one of the capabilities that I didn't talk about was um, from, a pro I talked about products, you know, components like level planning. So that's, you know, the, the little components that go into the port. From a full product perspective, you know, what we actually ship, there's a whole demand planning group that works on that. And they're constantly trying to, in, you know, um, improve their efficiencies as well, their forecast accuracy through machine learning by looking at, um, one of the ways that we use it is, is again, similar to plan for every part is how do you focus on those higher impact products and focus your time on forecasting that. So we're leveraging machine learning to pull, you know, that data and say, you know what, these historically will have like good forecast accuracy. Let's not focus our time there. Let's just pull that in and it'll automatically populate so that we can focus on the ones that, you know, the ones that matter and the ones that have higher ones. So those are just a couple of examples. Just to add to that, I think the other example that might resonate is I think we've called it as frictionless, but it's in our testing process, right? Where we figure out that a customer kind of tells us that, hey, there is a challenge or something broke with the product. Then we go back and say the machine learning then says, oh, that particular lot, which other customers have it so that how can we be more predictive and reach out proactively to the customer just saying, hey, this might happen or this might go wrong. And that's why we're going to send you a replacement or whatever that might be, right? So that's the other use case. Uh, but I think we use machine learning across the board in supply chain. Thank you. Yeah. I have a comment. Can you go back a couple of slides? To yeah. The last one. I was just go. Sorry. I just wanted to call out <laughs> another one in front, actually. You want to constrain your next. <laughs> no. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I guess we appreciate some of the balance between the two top items here. One is about customer experience. So I, we're in sales. So we're handling, I just say, um, frustrated customers <laughs> more, more often than not. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a cost with respect to supply chain in the last couple of years. And one of the things that, why I'm, I'm so proud of what the work, you know, Sri and everybody in the supply chain has done, is because they've balanced the social environmental concerns during that process. In other words, I think that if you really don't were to push a button, maybe we could have gotten product cheaper, or we didn't sacrifice some of the things that our public goals, you know, around environmental and sustainability, um, um, you know, that were, that were pub public. You know, so I just wanted to kind of say that those things often compete, but one of the things that having these stated strategies does for us and is that it allows us to make fewer decisions. You know, we don't have to keep, it's not competing anymore. Yeah. It's like, oh, we, no, we, no, we just can't do it any other way. Mm -hmm. You know, so a decision that it makes it, it really makes it simpler how we go forward. It's might be more painful at times. And, and you can probably admit if we just had to get, Get product. We could have gotten it probably a little bit quicker if we just sacrificed some of these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we are really creating the rules for the future, right? As you didn't the playbook, as you mentioned exactly. before. So I just wanted to appreciate the competition that happens and why I said that, because I see a lot of solar and um, I know Vince often talks about sustainability here on campus. I'm just saying that that stuff comes at some, some cost that Cisco has said, look, you know, yeah, this is how we're doing it too. So as far as Cisco is concerned with UCSD, you know, we're aligned in many more ways than you like, you know, than you realize on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, I just wanted to just point, no, out, point great, that out. Great point. point. Yeah. I know we want to give the last five minutes for our partners, but any other questions before? Hopefully that was insightful. Hopefully that helped like just give up a stack of like, you know, this is the supply chain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sri and Mary, for walking us through the future of the global supply chain. While you're in the Palooza Pavilion, please visit Cisco Food. For attendees, you're welcome to stroll through the pavilion and be sure to check out the posters from past Lean Six Sigma projects at UCSD. 
You can also check out the next sessions in the Price Center Theater, that's right below us, the Red Shoe Room across the way, Green Table Room, which is here, and the Bear Room across the way at, the, at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think Perfect. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Wayne Seidman uh, with uh, E Plus, County Executive. I'm joined by my uh, solutions architect, Sean Kyle. Pleasure to be here today. Um, I think with keeping with the theme today, we thought it'd be appropriate to talk about our newest offering with Cisco, our lifecycle services support. Uh, just a little bit about uh, E Plus before we jump in. So, uh, founded in 1990, we're uh, publicly listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, there's only 11% of companies that have been in business for 30 years that have been listed on NASDAQ. E Plus is one of those companies, which is pretty cool. We have 30 plus locations across the US, Europe, uh, Asia Pacific. And then we have almost 2,000 employees, half of which are engineers and project managers. So uh, we're really proud at E Plus. We're actually the first partner in North America to be certified for lifecycle services support. Um, so for uh, first call support, we have four network operations center across the U.S. that take first call, and um, we work with uh, our engineers across uh, multi-vendor architectural issues to help solve for our problems. Um, we also are uh, co-delivering this service with Cisco, so we're um, e-bonded with them through ServiceNow, so that way um, customer Cisco and E-plus has visibility into all the issues. And then um, we also do prioritization for P1 and P2 tickets. So um, we have a service level objective of 30 minutes, which is actually twice as fast as traditional support. And then um, we also will we'll go into some of the, the tools that come with the service right now. We're kind of just going over some of the people in the process. So uh, our managed services, we use ISIL um, processes, so continuous improvement using playbooks get uh, you know customers how they like to do business and uh, you know address issues as they come up and then um, we also have a customer success manager uh, that, that gets assigned to each customer and this is a little bit of a, a compatibility matrix on the different services um, so the first first column there is traditional Cisco smartnet second column is partner services and then the third column is uh, our newest offering the partner lifecycle services support. And one of the key differentiators for our lifecycle services support is that there's going to be additional prioritization, expertise, and efficiency. So we, we kind of talked a little bit about the, um, the service level objectives. Normally, it's 60 minutes with our lifecycle services support is 30 minutes. And then we also have um, cross architectural expertise. Um, then we have primary contacts and then third party support as well through multiple vendors. So we talked a little bit about the, the people, the process that comes with lifecycle services. And then there's a whole bunch of tool sets that we um, include for our customers. So the first is our executive dashboard that helps to provide um, uh, device monitoring, uh, health of the devices, get a high level, uh, you know, red, green, yellow, what's, what's the health of the network. And then um, we could dig down as far 
um, into the device of, of uh, granular as input the uh, ports and, and those kind of things as well. And then we, for our uh, monitoring software, we use science logic, which is actually the same software that NASA uses. Um, and then we kind of talked a little bit about the service now Ebon picketing. And then we also have a uh, system collector that helps with um, security uh, field notices, P certs, uh, end of life, end of support for the devices, and then different contract dates that we try to make sure uh, we consolidate and coach our everything you know, be consistent for our customers. And then the last um, tool that we provide for our customers on this part of the service is our uh, AMS, uh, our asset management service. Uh, powered by Ray Allen, um, and the, some of the benefits for that is that um, you get real-time visibility into your assets, uh, you get to manage OPEX expenses, mitigate, mitigate IT risk, um, and then you have insight across your entire IT environment. And uh, that's it. Any questions?